Hi y'all, Risha Job with the Concrete Ranch and today we're going to talk about what are trauma-informed equine-assisted services, the kind that we provide here at the Concrete Ranch and well how is it different from other kinds of equine facilitated or assisted therapy and learning services. And by the way, what the heck does it mean to be trauma-informed? We're going to learn and Rebecca's going to teach us today. See you there. When you start looking for equine assisted services or therapies, um, the internet is just full of all this information. And then how do you make a decision, you know, as a consumer of what am I looking for? How do I find it? Right? Because a lot of times when you look for equine, people say, I'm going to look for equine therapy and you put equine therapy in, you often get something called hippotherapy. And there are lots of different kinds of hippotherapy. Um, and so if you're looking for, you know, speech therapy or physical therapy or occupational therapy, those would all fall underneath hippotherapy. Uh, and, and so that would be what typically people are looking for. They're looking for services. Sometimes they think, well, equine therapy is only for people who have disabilities, right? Because you hear about therapeutic riding or hippotherapy for helping them with their having stronger bodies and stronger cores and more flexibility and things like that. And that's typically what comes up when you're looking um, on the internet. And so what we were thinking was help people understand like there are so many different kinds of equine assisted psychotherapy services in addition to the hippotherapy therapeutic riding. Um, how do you make sense of all of it, right? So there is this if I wanted to look for psychotherapy that involved horses, I made a whole list of them. Like, so you have natural life mission, and that's the model that we follow here at Pecan Creek Ranch. We have Igala, which has been around for a really long time. Um, Path International will show up under mental health services, but they're not a specific model of treatment. Uh, so therapists who work in the Path Centers can do whatever kind of therapy that they typically do, like psychodynamic or cognitive behavioral or gestalt. So any kind of therapy that you can have in the office, you can actually have that incorporates horses, which makes finding psychotherapy that involves horses really difficult to figure out what's gonna work for me. When you're looking at all of these kind of different kind of services, um, what we want you to think about is like, what, have it, what, have it, what am I trying to accomplish? So for, for us, the way that we approach therapy um, is very relational. So our kind of bottom, um, what am I trying to, how, how do I want to put it? Like the, th the theme that th runs through everything we do is about connection. It's about relationship. It's about learning how to have a healthy relationship with ourselves, other people, the world, the environment, your higher power. So everything we do, that's the theme. And we have lots of tools to help people learn how to have those healthier relationships. Um, we like to teach them about their body. We like to teach them about their nervous system and how it works. Um, what to do when your body's telling you, I don't really like that, or that makes me uncomfortable. Typically in America, what we're taught is just push through it, right? Fake it till you make it, right? And so when we do that though, what's, what are we telling our bodies? You know, if I'm pushing through something that makes me feel really, really uncomfortable and I'm not listening to my body, then my body either I start disconnecting from it because my body gets louder to say, hey, 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 I don't like that. I don't think that's very safe for us. And in order to manage that discomfort, I disconnect from it, which isn't a safe thing for us to do as humans. Um, so we try to teach people, like, how do you listen to your body? How do you know when something's really dangerous? How do you know when it makes you uncomfortable and you want to listen to your body and learn how to do it anyway? Like for me, public speaking, right? Mm -hmm. Public speaking can't 
kill me, but my body might make it sound like it could. <laughs> my heart starts beating really, really fast, you know. Uh, I might even, if I get really, really anxious, get dizzy, I feel like the world's spinning, right? And so my body's giving me all these signals of, uh, this is really, yeah, run, get out of here, right? Um, and so, but if I can catch it when it's early, that worry, and start to listen to my body and start to address what are the concerns, then my body can start to relax and start to see that this isn't dangerous. But if I just sometimes just try to push through it and ignore it, the only way I can do that is to disconnect from my body. And that's something that we don't want people or animals to do is to disconnect. Because our bodies are our alarm systems. That's how we know whether something's safe or isn't safe, right? So when you come out for services here at the Concrete Ranch, we are really going to try to help you connect to your body, understand what it's saying, understand what your nervous system is saying, understand what other beings' nervous systems are saying, whether that's another human, a horse, a dog, a cat, it doesn't matter. Um, we want to be able to um, know what to do to help us regulate our bodies, right? A lot of people don't know what to do other than to disconnect from their bodies. They don't know how to make their bodies feel safer inside. And so that's one of the things that we work on here is how do I let my nervous system know that actually what's happening now is safe, right? Um, and and so what makes us different is that we're really going to focus on these relationships, a relationship with self, relationship with others, other beings in the world, and help them to feel safe, help us to feel safe, because that's the way that the world is going to be safer for everyone when we start listening to each other, right? Um, so there's, in therapy, you can approach it like that from a relational attachment, neurobiological perspective. That's the perspective that we take. But you could also take it from a different perspective, which is a more cognitive perspective. And a lot of therapists work and they do cognitive behavioral therapy. They also do that and work with horses. And for some people, that works really, really well. Cognitive behavioral therapy, where you're just figuring out, well, what am I thinking? How's that making me feel? How's that affecting my body, those thoughts, right? And so the, the intervention comes from changing the thought, okay? Now, here we might work some with the thoughts, but the main focus isn't just the thought, just the thinking patterns. It's a, it's a bigger picture, I guess. We have a, a wider scope. So what you think does impact your relationships, um, but it's only one thing that impacts your relationships. And so all these different therapies out there, what happens is um, they kind of take different parts, I think, of how people function, and they specialize in helping people with that, right? And it becomes uh, so... Uh, insular. Um, and so there's, that's how we have all these different therapies. And that's why it's hard to know, well, what's going to help me, right? Uh, one of the things we tell people all the time is, when you're looking for therapy, make sure that you are really paying attention to the relationship with the therapist. Because therapists are like, uh, a good pair of shoes. You need to find one that you can take a journey in that doesn't pinch or hurt. Now, it's not that the work isn't going to hurt because the work can be uncomfortable, but the relationship with the therapist shouldn't be one that causes pain. This is why I kind of like to think about it. It might feel uncomfortable sometimes because you're talking about uncomfortable things, but you should be able to work through that. If you're fearing going to see the therapist, um, then that's an issue that you need to work on. And maybe that's not a therapist for you, right? Um, because therapist, um, working with a therapist is a journey, and it needs to be a, a semi, I would say, 
should be comfortable, except for the work is going to be hard, right? Um, and then you want to look for therapists that have the experience that you need. So some therapists are just starting out, and they're really good therapists, and they have lots of good training, um, but maybe they don't have training in what you need. Or maybe uh, they don't have enough experience providing the treatment that you need. And so those are things to look at for when you're looking for a therapist or an equine-assisted psychotherapy program. Do they have the experience you need? Do they have the amount of um, training or certifications or um, staff to meet your needs? Okay. Now, other things to think about is some equine assisted psychotherapy programs, the licensed mental health person works alone. They don't work in teams. And so that's something to think about too, is do you want to be able to do some different things? Like maybe you want to do something called rhythmic riding, which is a intervention that's a therapeutic intervention, but you have to have two people. Um, and so in order to safely do that, if that's the kind of intervention you need, then you need to look for a program that works in teams of an equine professional, a licensed mental health permission, uh, licensed mental health clinician. Um, maybe you don't need therapy. Maybe you need coaching. Maybe you just need assistance in getting over hard stuff in your life, uh, like um, difficult relationships or things that are kind of difficult at work or trying to figure out how do I get my needs met while in a relationship. You can get those kind of services through coaching or equine assisted learning. You could um, have those kind of services. So psychotherapy isn't the only thing that's out there and it's not what everybody needs. Everybody doesn't need psychotherapy. Um, but trying to figure out what you need can be difficult. And so talking to, to a licensed mental health person might be able to tell you, hey, that sounds like something a coach could help you with and not something that you necessarily need a therapist for. There are lots of relational uh, therapy services out there with, that work with horses. Natural Life Manship is one. The herd, uh, the herd model is another. And... I believe uh, the Hill model has some aspects of that as well, and there are others too. And so some of these um, relational models focus on just support from the horse. Some, like our services, focus on developing a healthy relationship with the horse, and some are trauma-informed services like natural lifemanship, which we do at Pecan Creek Ranch, and some are not trauma-informed. And so when we're looking at a trauma-informed service, what we're looking for is how do events impact our lives and understanding that. Does the organization understand how different events impact their lives, a person's life, and help them learn how to deal with those things? by learning how to listen to their neurobiology, how that affects their relationships with themselves and others, um, what their body is saying, how to calm their bodies down, um, and understanding that when an event happens that is adverse to our experience and our, that's an adverse experience in our life, it impacts us in a very specific way it can change the way that our bodies interact with ourselves and others, the way we think, the way we feel, uh, our safety. It usually impacts whether we feel safe with our bodies, others, and in the world. And so our services, when they're trauma-informed, are gonna address that in a very holistic way. You wanna look for a service that not only says that they're trauma-informed, but when you go and you visit, you can see it 
in the way that they're interacting, both with all the staff are interacting, the way that they interact with the other beings on the property, whether that might be horses or maybe they have cats or dogs. Um, you want to see how everybody is showing up in that relationship. What does that so, look, really look like? Well, thank you for asking, because <laughs> I was just fixing to say how that might look. Okay, so if, if I'm trauma-informed, then one of the things that I might be doing when I'm interacting with another being, let's say, uh, let's say a cat comes up in the barn, and I'm a trauma-informed agency, then I might, you might see me asking for consent to interact with or pet the cat. And if the cat says, no, I don't want to be petted, then I don't. Because that's me listening to what that being is saying. Okay. Um, if I'm not a trauma-informed organization, then maybe I just reach down and pet the cat or pick it up. Right? And I'm not really listening to what that being is saying to me. If I'm working with horses, for example, let's say you go for a tour at, on a facility, then you want to see how are they interacting with their horses? How do the horses interact with the people? Um, are they respecting their boundaries, meaning their bodies? That's what I mean by boundaries in this situation. Or, or they just walk up and kind of treat them like tools, right? Um, do they ask for what they want? Do they demand? Do they force? Do they use force? Because in a trauma-informed organization, typically you don't want to see that the people or the animals are being forced to do things unless it's, an, and I'm going to put this as a caveat, an emergency, right? So let's say... A horse has cut his neck. It's got, you know, an artery exposed. Well, we're going to have, that's an emergency. We're going to have to do some things that that horse may not want or consent to in that moment, just like if a, for a person, right? Um, but in general, when you're interacting with them, how are that, how are that, how is that happening, right? Um, if the horse gets too close to the uh, person, how do they respond to that? Do they push them away? Do they hit them with the rope? Do they ask them to move away? These are the things that you want to pay attention to because those are the things that are also going to help your body know whether it's safe or not there, mm -hmm. right? And in, in trauma-informed services, we want to pay very close attention to creating a very safe, environment for all beings. We want to have a physically safe environment. We want to have an emotionally safe environment. And what I mean by that is, in an emotionally safe environment, I should be able to make mistakes in how I talk, in how I try to express myself. It doesn't have to be perfect. A horse or an animal can make a mistake, and the world doesn't come to an end. Like. I can, the horse can bump me, let's say he pushes me with my body. And maybe I didn't really like that. Uh, but the way that I communicate that I didn't like that doesn't um, cause harm to the horse and it doesn't cause harm to the relationship. That I can say, hey, wait, okay, that, I didn't really like you pushing me like that. Can you back up a little bit? and then ask, try again with what you were asking, right? Um, so we want to be able to be, have an emotionally safe environment, meaning that we can make mistakes. We don't have to be perfect. Um, that, trying to think about other things that make emotionally safe things. Um, all the feelings that you're experiencing. Any you're feeling. Valid. Any feeling you feel, whether at, a lot of people think, well, if I'm coming to work with horses, then I can only be happy because, you know, horses only want to be around happy people. And that's one of the things that um, is so, I think, powerful when you're working with um, horses is they accept you just the way you are as long as you're honest. The honest piece us humans have a hard time with. 
as being congruent, meaning our insides and our outsides match. <clears throat> and horses are really sensitive to that because they're prey animals. But humans in our regular everyday life feel like, most of us feel like, nobody really wants to know how I'm feeling. So I have to pretend. And when you pretend with a horse, that makes them feel unsafe. And so you get a chance to work on that. So any feeling you have, whether you're sad, you're angry, you're uh, joyful, you're scared, whatever it is, that's a safe environment to feel that. Out here at Peconcrete Ranch, we don't, when we see kids, we talk to parents about, we don't have a lot of rules about how kids can talk to us because it's really, really hard to talk about hard things. And so if we have a lot of rules about how we talk with, about hard things, then that makes it even harder. And so um, we, that's one of the ways that we create emotional safety is that you can say whatever you need to say as long as you're not trying to hurt somebody. And if you say it in a way that's going to be hurtful to somebody, we're just going to ask you to try it again. Um, so you get a chance to know how to do it without hurting somebody. I didn't really like it when you um, get raised your voice at me. Okay, let's say a kid feels like I yelled at them and they say, I didn't really like it that you uh, raised your voice at me. That's an okay way to say that. But if they called me names or picked up a rock and threw it at me, that wouldn't be very safe. And so we might ask that they try. We they wouldn't may. We would ask that they try again. Um, and it wouldn't have to be perfect. So that's emotional safety. Another part of being trauma-informed is your providers being very present in their bodies and paying attention to what their nervous system is saying to them about what's happening in the interaction and helping you to be able to uh, notice those changes as well. But I think one of the biggest, most powerful parts of being trauma-informed is being able, your providers are being able to not only be present but regulated and that they can help your body become, feel safer by what they do with their bodies, whether that is the way that their heart's beating or their breathing or that they're using visual cues of uh, rhythm and predictability, maybe they are uh, going foot to foot, or maybe they're using their voices in a very rhythmic way. When you say regulated, do you mean calm? Are you talking about just being calm? Not necessarily. Regulated for me means that your body, you're able to raise your energy when you need to, and you're able to lower your energy when you need to, that you're in control of your body and what it's doing and and how you're using it. And so I could be regulated but have lots of big energy. Or I could be dysregulated, not in charge of my body or my energy, and have big energy. Or I could be dysregulated and have very low energy. Right? Um, Okay, yeah, so if a kid comes in with high energy, then we meet that energy because we're trying to attune to that person and let them, and let them know that we hear them, right. right? We're gonna join with them and be in that high energy. We might even take it even higher, mm -hmm. right? And really help to move this person's body in specific ways to help them to be able to get in control of their body. So we might be doing lots of large, big movements and, and do it in rhythmic ways. We might play, we might run, we might throw a ball and do all these things to make our bodies bigger and then slowly be bringing it down. And then we bring it back up and then we bring it back down in a really playful way so that people learn how to be able to listen to their body and help their bodies do what they're asking for what, what's needed in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. Our, we're often are helping people, people say, calm down, calm down. Well, that's not really the only thing we need to learn. We need to learn how to raise our energies too mm -hmm. and raise it and lower it as the situation dictates. 
right? When kids are at school and they're supposed to be taking a test, having high energy and bouncing off the walls, that's not going to be very helpful, right? But if you're playing a game of tag, then you need your energy to come up, right? So you need to also be able to bring it, bring it down. And so attunement is what you're talking about right. there. And that's so, I think it's so important to attune not only to others, but to ourselves, right? And so when you're looking for a provider, you want to have a feeling that this person attunes to you and sees you and, and, and kind of gets you. It's really not nice. really right. It's not really what they're saying. It's how you're feeling in their presence, right? Uh, one of the things I think of is, do I feel welcome here? Does my body feel safe here? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, because we can't do hard work if we don't feel some sense of safety and, and attunement and being seen. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, and can they, if your energy gets chaotic and out of control, can they handle it? Theirs? Yes. Because of that, or are they able to? Even right. if your energy is chaotic. And because that control. creates us. When, you, when somebody's energy goes big and chaotic and the, the people who are there can stay calm, that helps create safety, mm -hmm. right? But if somebody is out of control and then we get out of control, then that's not a, that's not a safe environment. That becomes very scary. The same thing, I think, happens with the horses. Like when we're out with the herd and we're with cli a client, uh, perhaps, and the horses, maybe they start playing, and they start running around and nipping and rearing up, and their energy gets big, and you can always feel the client's bodies ten you know, tense up because that, that's, they're, big. they're huge, yeah. and they move fast, and even though we might not be that close, your body responds to that. Well, if we got worried and scared, then the client wouldn't feel safe, so another way to kind of to think about it um you mentioned rhythm and predictability a lot why is that important so why is rhythm and predictability important so for our nervous systems in order for our nervous systems to feel safe we need rhythm and predictability uh, i like to kind of think about like when we're first born and people are taking care of babies now. Like, what do we do for babies? Well, we provide rhythm. We provide consistency and predictability. And, and we might bounce them and rock them, right? But we don't just do it on this side, right? Uh, what do we do? Oh, no, we bounce them over here, right? I'm even on this left cheek now. And now I'm going to be on my right cheek over here. And so we're getting both sides of their body, both sides of their nervous system. I might be swaying. And when I do these things, it helps to organize the nervous system. Well, guess what? Adults need it too. We don't stop needing all of that rhythm and uh, that kind of input just because we're older. Mm -hmm. We still need it. And so you want to, I think, when you're looking for providers, you want to look for this kind of knowledge and these kind of things, right? Do they understand how our bodies actually work? And can help you learn how your body works and what your body needs, what your body's saying, so that you can become um, a better listener and a better, better steward of yourself. Um, and at Pecan Creek Ranch, we do that through working with horses, right? Some people work in offices. We work outside in, in pastures with horses. And people get to learn how to listen to their bodies, listen to somebody else's bodies, and practice these skills in the moment and not just talk about it, All right? And so what makes us different here? Because there's lots of therapy programs that work with horses. I mean, there's a ton of them, even in our area. And so what makes us different? Well, we have decades of experience treating trauma. Um, we, Our staff are... We have two staff who are advanced certified in natural life manship. Um, everybody who works here has to be working on certification in natural life manship. Um, we have two natural life manship trainers on staff. Um, so we have lots of experience in the model that we are providing treatment in. 
Um, our clinicians are all, or therapists, some people use the word therapist, are all licensed. Um, and they have lots of experience in the models of, of, that they provide treatment in. And they have lots of experience in certifications and other trauma models. So not just one necessarily. Um, and so that, those kind of things make us different because of our expertise. Okay? Um, we have staff here are considered leaders in their field. Um, and so that's something that makes us vastly different. And then I think the other thing that makes us really different, and people feel it when they come you know, for uh, what we call a meet and greet, which is a block of time to come and just meet us and see the facility and meet our horses, is how different our horses are. When you come out to meet our horses, they're very relational. They really usually express interest in who's here and what's going on. Um, and that's because of the way we interact with our horses all the time. The principles that we use to help people, we interact with our horses with 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We don't just treat them one way when the clients are here and a different way when the client isn't here. They are treated the same way with the healthy principles that we interact with people with um, because of the work that we do. And we, we want our horses to feel seen and heard just like we want our clients to feel seen and heard. Um, at the Concrete Ranch, we only provide therapeutic services, meaning that we don't do other things here. We don't, um, we don't have boarding. We don't have people on property, um, riding lessons and things like that. And the reason that's important is because you're going to see that everybody interacts with the horses in the same way, and they interact with each other in the same way. You're not going to have on in one pasture somebody trying to dominate and control a horse, and you're trying to have your therapy session over here and learn about healthy relationships when over here power and control is happening. So... We don't have that kind of dichotomy here. Um, we made a, a big choice to set aside um, this whole space to be a safe, therapeutic environment for everyone who shows up. And we feel like that is a, an important dedicated space for people to come and really heal from the things that are happening in their lives.